Hi, this is Jurgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. In today's episode, I'm going to critique John Grinder's New Code NLP. What I perceive to be the strengths and the weaknesses of that particular orientation based upon my experience in using it with a lot of clients over a long period of time. In this particular critique, I'm not going to touch on the topic of NLP modeling at all. It's going to be exclusively about change work with clients and self-application, meaning change work with self. So I did a Richard Bandler critique uh, a little while back, and uh, some people pointed out that it would be only fair that I did a John Grinder critique as well. Now, I did make a video a couple of years ago called What John Grinder Taught Me, which if you're interested in my thoughts around this, might be worth checking out as well. So let me start off with my own biases here. Uh, I have a very favorable impression of John Grinder, and John Grinder has been extremely generous towards me. So I first met John in London in 2003, and uh, one of the things that really impressed me with John was that I have a tendency to, to ask tough questions and to kind of be the, the, the devil's advocate. And I, I, I tend to, to push a lot of teachers uh, to the max. And while a lot of people give lip service to appreciating that, John Grinder is one of the few people I have met who really seem to enjoy it, to relish in the role, and to really welcome it, which, uh, which really impressed me. That, that, that was an unusual uh, experience for me. And then in 2005, he did a seminar in Oslo where well, I asked him some questions, and, and some of the questions he had... Um, been anticipating for a long time that someone would ask him, uh, but people hadn't. So we had a very good rapport, and a lot of the seminar essentially became an, an exchange between me and him that, that people seemed to enjoy. And uh, since then, we had, uh, we had a sort of informal mentoring relationship for many years, I would say five or six years where we had a lot of contact, uh, mostly by email, and I, I would shoot him questions, he, he would answer, uh, he, he would give me tasks to do, things to test out with clients. And uh, the shared generosity that he showed in, in doing that and, and, and being willing to, to explore with me in, in that way is something that I will always cherish. Um, I also at the time ran an impossibles practice, meaning inspired by Bandler and Grinder back in the day, where, where I, I would seek out clients who had not succeeded in traditional forms of therapy and offer to work with them with a no change, no pay policy. It's nothing I do anymore, but it's something I used to do at the time. And one of the times when John came to Oslo, he, he contacted me and said, uh, uh, Jurgen, do you have any impossibles for me? You know, I'm, I'm going to kick your ass and show you how it's done. And he, he actually volunteered to uh, to work with a couple of clients. And he did at least one, one or two sessions with one particular client. No money involved, uh, just the curiosity to see if he could make a difference. Um, I think that speaks volumes. I think relatively few name instructors would be willing to do uh, such a thing. I, I have a friend who worked in psychiatric care in in, uh, in the UK who, who John was willing to go along with her to the psychiatric unit and started doing, you know, idiomotor signaling and all sorts of stuff with, with people in uh, inside there. So, so he, he, uh, he, he has an element of walking his talk uh, that I think is, is quite unusual. Also, my mother, uh, <clears throat> and <clears throat> something else too, uh, one day he called me and said, you know, what are you doing on Friday? Because he, he was in Oslo, and I said, well, you know, whatever you, do you have any ideas? And well, I'm working with this um, cancer client, you know, would you be willing to tag team? And 
So we did a long session, uh, you know, double induction, all sorts of work. Now she, she still died. Um, we, we didn't get anywhere per se. But, but that willingness to, to try anything and, and, and to work uh, with anything. Uh, one of the big influences for me, paradoxically, was, was seeing him fail you know, with some clients and not get the results. Of course, I knew from real life experience that change work can be very messy, but, but to see him fail with clients, fail as in not, clients not necessarily changing, and to be okay with that, um, that 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 was extremely uh, useful for me as a as a student and uh, as an explorer. Uh, also, my my mother uh, developed a cancer of the eye at the time, and uh, I, I took my mother to Santa Cruz, California. You know, we went on a little vacation, and we went to see John, and he, he did some change work with her. Uh, again, for free, just just a willingness to 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 test that out. Um, my mother didn't change based upon that. Um, she got medical treatment that 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 helped. Uh, and, and this is not a diss to 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 John. In in my view, that this is a positive thing: being willing to take on and 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 do do the experiments. So, so based upon all this, you know, I, I have a very favorable uh, impression of John, and and uh, it it might influence my critique. So, for example, with with Bandler, I you know, and people like Tad James and um, other people whose work I critiqued, I, I pointed out some what I perceive to be ethical flaws. I I haven't really seen them in John in that way. You know that that doesn't mean that he's an utopian human being or or anything like that. I'm sure he has a lot of them. Um, I, I I just haven't seen them in the same way. And and my favorable impression of him might be skewing my perceptions in, in a way that doesn't quite allow me to 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 see those things. So so that's just to be straight about my own biases. Um, going into this so let's let's take a little look at new code nlp which 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 we would call call grinder's version of nlp versus bander's more version of nlp um, one thing that really strikes me with grinder and i highly recommend reading his book whispering in the wind uh, there's a great section there on epistemology. In, in, in my view, that section on epistemology and, and how the map is not the territory and how the territory isn't even the territory is the best writing on that particular topic that I have found in any NLP book. And he, he, he makes it clear that the territory isn't even the territory, meaning that so much of what we see and, 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 you know, so much of the world per se doesn't even enter into our representations. And whatever does enter into our representations, whether it's sights, sounds, you know, felt experience, it's, it's always influenced by these pre-verbal um, factors. And also very often, before the fact, influenced by our expectations and our beliefs and stuff like that. He does a very good job in pointing out that there really is no such thing as direct experience. So a lot of the, in the meditation world, you know, people talk a lot about direct experience. And, and Grinder does a very good job in pointing out that there really is no such thing. Simultaneously, he will strongly advocate, advocate for the usefulness of getting as close to direct experience as possible, not working so much in the linguistic realm of beliefs and identities and self-concepts, but, but getting closer to direct experience. That, that's really a hallmark of Grinder's work. That and simplicity and minimalist tendencies. So where you see a lot of people 
try to add more complexity and more steps, Grinder has a tendency to, to, to more do his best to slice away all the unnecessary fat. Like, can I get to the same place with fewer steps? As in, what can I take away here? And he, he often used the analogy of, of the professional athlete versus the amateur athlete, you know, where he, he would make the point that the, the really experienced pro does less. There's less muscle tension. He only moves when he has to. He only tenses when he has to. <clears throat> so as an example of this, and I've, I've mentioned this in previous uh, top videos on the topic of NLP, Whenever I've gotten into a mode where I've gone, you know, well, what is there to NLP really? And I've, I've studied other forms of, you know, psychotherapy and, and hypnosis and uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, it, it never takes me long to appreciate the power of the meta model. Like whenever I've gone to a coaching seminar or some sort of psychotherapy seminar, I'm shocked by the amounts of mind reads and, and projections and all the, the content that people impose on each other without realizing that they're doing it. And the huge strength in the meta model, and I don't see anything like this in you know cognitive behavioral therapy or rational emotive behavior therapy. I don't see a tool as effective as the meta model in helping people to not project uh, and mind read as much and to be able to connect language to its kind of original sensory experience. So Grinder has been able to kind of take away, you know, reduce the meta model to what he calls the verbal package, which is essentially asking the questions, which specifically for nouns and how specifically for verbs. And if you play with that, you'll realize that you can get to the exact same point that the meta model will bring you in far fewer steps. So I'll give you an example of this. I worked with a school teacher once <clears throat> who said, my life is awful. You know, it's, it's just terrible. And she came into my office in this, this state of being quite depressed. And I, I said to her, which life? specifically and she looked at me a bit stunned like are, are you rude or something like what do you mean that no which part of life specifically your your home life your marriage your relationship with your kids your work is like no 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 it's 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 my school life it's my 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 work as a teacher ah uh, which which part of your school life specifically meetings with parents or is this like no um 6b like class 6b every tuesday and thursday <clears throat> which part of class 6b specifically well john and jim i'm just making up two names here well yeah john and jim are a problem well, john and jim are a problem how specifically so but, but by asking the questions in this way, we were able to isolate some very specific contexts and then have a very minimalist intervention that made a huge difference. So that, that's a, a, a great contribution of John's and something that he uh, um, emphasizes a lot in, in the new code NLP. Um, what else? Well. So th th there are some interesting, John has a tendency to emphasize physiology, movement and, and games quite a bit. And he points out that some of the states which are the most challenging to people are often the states that we move into so slowly that we don't quite detect that we're in the ship before we're really there. It's, it's like the whole frog soup phenomenon. Um, and, and also states that we go into so quickly that we're not quite able to, 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 to catch ourselves or to notice it but before we're there. It might be states like rage and, and stuff like that. So, so he has this, this uh, format he calls stalking, 
or sanctuary, you know, where, where you slowly, you, you create two states, you know, the, the, the kind of problem state, for example, rage or, or depression, and you, you, you spatially locate it. And then you have like a more neutral, clear state that you spatially locate somewhere else. And then you begin to move very slowly towards that problematic state. And as soon as you feel the first signal of going there in, in your body, you jump back. You, you jump back, shake state, and go back to neutral. And, and, and you repeat it. And, and, and this trains your system to, like at the first sign of going there, creating an interrupt. So that you have choice, more choice about whether to go there or not. So th th this is a type of like minimalist uh, intervention with as little uh, with a, as little content in position as possible. Um, if if we look at the new code change format, so. In, in the old uh, classic code format, you know, people would consciously select their desired states. So you, you might first kind of elicit what the problem is. You know, I experience rage in this particular context or I experience fear when this happens. And the person might consciously uh, determine their desired state and then you might uh, consciously um, select the resources um, that you're going to bring into the context and consciously kind of determine how you're going to behave differently and then do some sort of intervention alongside that. So for example, let's take a, a typical collapse anchor, for example, where, where you might <clears throat> anchor the problem state on one knuckle, right? And then you might might stack <clears throat> a bunch of resource states on the other knuckle. And then you might fire off both to create an anchor collapse to neutralize them, releasing the negative one before the positive one. That, that could be a typical classic case, uh, classic code uh, intervention. In, in John Grinder's new code NLP, you consciously select the context but, and, and the, the intent, but everything else is left to the unconscious, as Grinder puts it. So what you might do is you might select a particular context where you feel stuck or behave in a way that you wouldn't like. So you hallucinate yourself from third position in that context. You spatially anchor it to the floor, and then you step into that representation and get in touch with the kinesthetics, right? Then you step out of it and you break states. Now, what you then will do is to use a game. It might be what Grinder calls the alphabet game or the NASA game. The, these are games designed to create a high-performance states. So as you play this game, your coach will be calibrating you until you seem to be in a good high performance or flow state. And then when the coach gives you a cue, you are to step into the context with the high performance states. A attempting to attach the high performance state to the contextual triggers. Now, the really important part here is that you're not consciously trying to influence anything. You're not consciously trying to select the right behavior. You're not even consciously trying to select the proper state. All of this is handed over to the unconscious, so to speak. And I've seen some very interesting and good results doing this and, and and a big part of the strength is that this is as close to a content free pure process intervention as you can get like you are imposing minimally on the client of course 
there is no such thing as completely content free. You know, you, you are imposing that uh, the work is to be done at the level of state, for example, and that you're going to use games. Um, and there's really nothing like a know nothing state, although you could say that what is known at the level of content has so little to do with the content of the problem state that it's, it's virtually a know nothing state, right? So the actual states and behaviors that result as, uh, as a consequence of these games can often be a, a surprise for both the client and the agent of change. So, 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 so this really emphasizes the client's self-sufficiency and, and um, solutions being generated from within. Like instead of a coach that kind of imposes particular beliefs or values or personality profiles or, or theories onto the client. It, it, it's very clean. It's very minimalistic and it can be extremely elegant. There's also the opportunity, you know, what it also opens for is that you can work with people for issues or contexts where you yourself have no personal competency whatsoever because because it's so it's so process driven. There is also the opportunity that you can do the work without you knowing anything about the content, right? So, so the change work might be more secretive. There's even the possibility that that the work can be a secret consciously for both you and the client. You can get the person to unconsciously select what to work on and then attach a high performance state to the contextual triggers. Um, so, so these are real benefits. And, and Gringer has in seminars emphasized that uh, this really replaces all previous NLP patterning. And here, I strongly disagree. This has not been the case at all in my experience. So one of, one of my objections to this is of course that, you know, some people just won't be able to relate to it. Like it, it, it doesn't resonate with their model of the world. Some people might have attention spans or be so obese or so out of shape or so uncoordinated that it's going to be a big hassle to use games with physiology, for example, to, to get them into high performance states. Some people who do a lot of performance anxiety bring that performance anxiety into the attempt to activate these high performance states. So that, that, that can be a big drawback. And also, in, in my experience, this is the most useful when you have issues where there are very clear contexts. I have not had as much success with this if you have, for example, a person with uh, panic attacks that seem to you know, come out of the blue, or migraine headaches, or chronic pain, where, where someone might more or less be in a particular state, uh, or mode of functioning most of the time. So, so for these sorts of issues, I, I haven't found this to be a good, um, a good uh, source for the most part. Now, something else too, and, and th this, is, this is a place where Grinder and I seem to disagree quite a bit. Um, one of the things that has really influenced me has been the work of Albert Ellis, you know, and, and the, the skill he has in pointing out uh, how so much of people's issues are the result of masturbatory demands, musts, needs, should, and, and basic thinking errors that people make in quite predictable ways, you know, rating ourself globally instead of rating our behaviors, for example. And my experience has been that for the most part, I would rather work in that direction than in the new code direction. Now, Grinder 
would say that nah you know like all of these you know beliefs and ways of meaning making and stuff like that are so state dependent like change the states and you blow all of that stuff out and that can certainly be true and, and certainly uh, be the case but, but i've discovered that it's not necessarily the case at all you know and sometimes uh, interventions at the level of state might not be the appropriate one. Like sometimes people lack uh, a, a good life philosophy, a, a good ethical compass. You know, they, they might lack the ability to make certain distinctions. They might lack good boundaries. They, they, they may have deep assumptions um, or, or, or beliefs that, that uh, you might do a good service in helping them um, dispute or, or explore. So I remember very clearly once working with a religious woman who, who was kind of imposing her religious beliefs strongly on her kids and it created a huge rift in the family. And um, we, we, we did a pretty content free new code intervention for one of the main contexts. And she went into wonderful high performance states but she became even more of a religious nut as a result. Like she was even more determined, even more focused in imposing uh, this religious stuff on her kids. And it, it made everything worse. So, you know, a, an assassin might become a better assassin if, if you link a good high performance state to certain contextual triggers. Um, there's there, there's no guarantee that people might become more sane or more rational or, or more functional as a result of attaching a high performance state to particular uh, triggers. Something else here too. Um, in my experience, if we can kind of tamper down on the self-referential thinking people will automatically have a tendency to enter what you could call flow states. So I, I, I think there's something to be said about the view that, that if, if, if you can reduce the rumination activity, then flow states or high performance states are, are very natural. Instead of thinking of it as something to be created through a particular game. Something else I also lacked emphasis on a little bit in New Code is, in my experience, you, you often get the most bang for the buck if you can help someone to fundamentally change their relationship to their inner experience. And um, I, I don't quite see that, that New Code work necessarily, uh, necessarily does that. Um, I had one more point there. Take a quick break to see if... Yeah, so I, I also think that there's a good point in, like, and this isn't necessarily a limitation of the new code, but, but, but sometimes students can become so obsessed with being in the right state or am I in a high performance state, whereas a lot of life is about learning to be functional in pretty much any state, to, to be able to create or perform or deal with for, from wherever state that you naturally find yourself. Um, and I, I think by helping people to change their relationship to their inner experience, you often get more bang for the buck there. Um, Grinder, of course, is good at pointing out to people that unconscious and conscious are are you know linguistic constructs they're they're fiction in a sense but they can be useful fiction to impose to attempt to move things around now this the students don't necessarily always get that get that so in in quite a few of the grinder formats where you set up involuntary signals with the unconscious uh, it seems as if some students all, almost turn it into a secular form of religion. Like instead of praying to God 
and getting the right answer from God. It's more like, well, I'm, I'm going to turn this over to my unconscious and my unconscious has told me and, and therefore that's absolutely true. I think this is a huge trap. Uh, you know, I, I think it's way more useful to, to view it as just another information sort. Grinder makes a comment too that I strongly disagree with and, and he says that if you get a truly involuntary signal from the unconscious, you can always trust it. This, is, this has not been the case in my experience. As a matter of fact, I hardly do that type of work at all because I find it so unreliable. Especially this idea that you're, you're, you're going to use unconscious signals to derive images and internal dialogue, you know, some form of communication. In, in my experience, uh, the value of these signals are very, very shaky. I, I've seen all sorts of unconscious promises of changes and miracles uh, where the signals seem very involuntary and where it's all bullshit. So uh, th these are things that I've pretty much uh, stopped doing. Now, one final point, you know, Grinder is very good at emphasizing how beliefs are limiting and how identity is a trap and, and how self-concept really is a bunch of BS, right? It tries to get people closer to direct experience. And he, he has a beautiful quote in his book, Whispering in the Wind, where he says something to the extent of the question is not what is real. The question is, in how many ways can we appreciate that which surrounds us? There, there's a beautiful relativism, a, a beautiful both and 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 logic. Uh, there, there's a deep appreciation for paradox, ambiguity, context. Um, and for Grinder, I think, this form of relativism, capacity for systemic thinking, ease of paradox, I think opens up for, for a richer model of the world. But I think for quite a few of the students, it, it, it gets turned into this absolutist ideology that's not necessarily uh, that rich. Um, So, so, for example, if, if you, and I know that, you know, I have a tendency to like developmental models a bit. Grinder has a tendency to, to view it as BS. So, so we're, we're, we're but, but in my view, you know, people have a tendency to, to naturally want to develop the sense of a stable, autonomous, independent self. And then if people move beyond that, they might begin to deconstruct it, right? So at, at the time I met Grinder, you know, I had a pretty stable sense of the autonomous, permanent, stable core self. So being introduced to that type of message, what, what, what was a great, uh, a great message for me. But what I notice is that quite a few seminar attendees might not yet have developed that inner voice, that inner sense of authority, right? They, they might be more fused with a group identity or, 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 or the, their, their sense of self might be very strongly derived by what they think other people think they fundamentally are, right? So their next developmental journey might be to develop exactly that inner sense of authority you know to be able to, to take a step back and look at what do i believe or what do i value and and, and who, who am i fundamentally in relation to other people so if if someone operates there and you get a guy like grinder with this extreme relativism and this extreme everything's kind of made up um constructed orientation i i think one consequence of that is that he ends up deconstructing and tearing down essentially the the capacity to form for people to form their own values and beliefs and and, and sense of self right so um so i think uh, 
I, I, I think the work can be paradoxically anti-developmental um, in that sense. So that's it for this episode. I, I hope you have found it useful. I, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts, especially if you have any experience with new code NLP and classic code NLP. Feel free to comment. Um, if you like the way I work, my ideas, I, I see clients on Skype from all over the world. Uh, I do seminars. My next seminar is going to be in Birmingham, uh, September 25th, 26th on the psychological illusion model. You can go to provocativehypnosis.com to, to see the link to the seminar. Um, yes. So again, thanks for, thanks for listening.